registered organ, eye, and tissue donor with Donate Life Texas means that you one day have the power to save eight lives as an organ donor and can enhance the lives of 75 others through tissue donation. But what about saving lives today? With living donation, individuals can altruistically donate one of their kidneys or a portion of their liver to save someone else's life. Over the years, the dynamic changes to the living transplant programs and even the use of social media has helped transplant patients get life-saving organs from complete strangers. Living donation has become so common that in 2020, more than 5,700 transplants were from living donors, according to the United Network of Organ Sharing. With March being National Kidney Month, we thought it was the perfect time to learn more about living kidney donation. Today on TOSA Talks, we'll hear from DHR Health Transplant Institute's Dr. Philip Thomas and Lizette Valdez, who donated a kidney to her dad in 2015. First, let's welcome Dr. Thomas. The DHR Transplant Institute is located in Edinburgh and serves as the only transplant center in the Rio Grande Valley. Can you tell us a bit more about DHR's kidney transplant program? Today is the anniversary, as it turns out, of the first kidney that we did in DHR four years ago. And that transplant went very well. It was a live donor transplant. The patient is doing well to this day with a normal creatinine. The donor is fine as well. It was a daughter who donated to her father. And why was it so important to have a transplant program here in the Rio Grande Valley? Oh, for the very simple reason that the closest transplant center is about four hours away. Uh, I used to work in Galveston and uh, we used to get some of our best patients from the valley. We ran a clinic here every month. And I used to joke with the patients that, you know, when you drive up from Galveston to, from the valley to Galveston, you may take uh, six to seven hours to come and we keep the kidney for you. But when you send you back after two weeks or three weeks that you stay here, you may take twice that time because you'll have to stop to pee every often, <laughs> you know. So that was uh, uh, the reason, you know, that we knew that the Valley has a lot of patients who need transplant. Even if a patient were to be, were to elect or want to be transplanted outside the Valley, they have to come back and live here. Mm -hmm. And sometimes they need to have access to a transplant surgeon and a facility uh, as an emergency. Since establishing their program in 2016, DHR has transplanted 66 patients with 19 of them being from living donors. And of course, Nationwide, there's about 83% of the transplant patients that are waiting for a kidney. And we know that with a new patient being added to the waiting list every 10 minutes, a patient faces a really long wait for their life-saving gift. What makes living donation a better option for a patient needing a kidney? And also, who can be eligible to be a living donor? The difference between a living donor and a deceased donor is the difference between life and death. You know, it's as simple as that. I don't like statistics a lot, but statistically speaking, it has about double the long-term number of years of survival as compared to the deceased donor kidneys. So those are the uh, sort of scientific reasons, if you like. On the other hand, what makes a live donor kidney transplant a very good option is that most of our patients coming to transplant nowadays have uh, multi-system uh, comorbidities. Mm -hmm. And suppose somebody is frail, suppose he's got a cardiac issue. You optimize that and tell him that, you know, you may have to wait six years. Um, things can go downhill after that. Whereas with a live donor transplant, you can work to a date, a schedule, optimize them, get them transplant, and then maintain their optim optimization. So that's another uh, big advantage of having a live donor. For sure. And if for people who are maybe interested in becoming a living donor, what kind of qualifications do they need to have? Or how do they know whether they may be a potential option for someone on the waiting list? So we tell the live donors who come to us that the only way they can be a donor is, is if they're 200% fit. They're fit for themselves and fit for one more person. That's a bit of an exaggeration, of course, but it's mainly to convey that message which suggests that somebody who is 200% fit today and has an expected lifespan over the population average is brought down to that population mean by the process of donation. So this is not a decision without consequences. And they have to face the consequences. They have to agree 
or be motivated enough to face consequences. Having said that, they also have to be willing to mitigate those consequences. And perhaps the only thing we have now in our hands is if they maintain, uh, if they pledge or they promise to maintain fitness lifelong, right. which means weight control, uh, diet and exercise, and regular annual physical examinations. And so we talked about who could be a, you know, a possible candidate, but again, there, there's probably someone who's watching this who's interested in becoming a living donor, either to someone that they know or to a complete stranger. What does that process look like to become a living donor? You just have to show up and say, I want to be a donor. If you have a recipient, then your workup will be built to the recipient. If you don't have a recipient, there's perhaps a little bit more of a uh, complex process to figure out how to pay for the workup, mm -hmm. but uh, it's a very extensive, very thorough workup. And uh, if there's anything that is wrong with them, we will find out. Right. And that may or may not uh, preclude donation, but at least they will know, and then they can, uh, you know, do what is necessary to prevent uh, problems arising from from that. Uh, whatever we find out. So a physical exam, uh, height, weight. Um, is something that we uh, would be a baseline workup, blood pressure, vital signs. And uh, that's all the screening that we really need up front. Aside from their deceased and living donor programs, Dr. Thomas says that DHR is working to establish a paired kidney program. In this scenario, recipients who have would-be donors but are unfortunately incompatible are able to match with other donor recipient pairs in the same situation. And soon enough, it'll even be easier to become a living donor thanks to Donate Life America. The organization announced that it will soon launch the National Donate Life Living Donor Registry at registerme.org. When people sign up to become an organ, eye, and tissue donor, they'll also be allowed to declare their intent to be a living donor. Thank you, Dr. Thomas and DHR Transplant Institute for visiting with us to explain living kidney donation. Our next guest, Lizette Valadez, is no stranger to the DHR program. Lizette, six years ago, you donated a kidney to your dad at DHR. Can you tell us about your decision to be a life-saving donor and why you found it to be the best option for your dad? Yes, I did make the decision to be a living donor, especially to my father, uh, six years ago. He was already under dialysis for four years and had been on the waiting list for well, those four years, but they had told him that it was approximately 10 to 12 years on the waiting list. Mm -hmm. His health was um, getting worse and worse. So it was a very sad scene, especially because you didn't know how to help. And um, one special day that I was there at home while we were waiting for him to arrive from dialysis, um, I happened to open the door when he, you know, rang the doorbell. And when I did, he fainted on my arms. But that was the day I made the decision. I think that was the best option for, my, for, for me to do this for my father because it literally, literally stopped that big gap of getting worse and just took a 360 turn on his life. And as a living donor and a family member of a patient who was in need, why do you think it's important for people to consider living donation? Well, first of all, the most important thing, because you get to give someone, you get to change someone else's story. As a family member, if, if you want to donate your kidney, because we can live up a one, I'm proof of it. And not only did I um, did something great, but it's also something great for me. Because I take care of myself better. I eat better. I am more, because now I, I am aware of what I did. And, you know, now I, instead of two, you only have one. So of course you want to take better care of yourself. Right. And what was your dad's reaction when you told him that you've made this decision to, to be a living donor? I remember it was November 14, 2014. And it only took me uh, three weeks to get everything uh, done. Um, I took the initiative to call the dialysis office. Mm -hmm. And I just said, I want to be a living donor for my father. Obviously, they referred me to the, uh, the experts, right? So I was 
call after call following the steps what I needed to do because don't get me wrong I had no idea how to go about it but I asked so I was following instructions and it only took me three weeks to get my my lab work my test and, and everything so that was pretty fast and they gave me the option do you want to do it before the year ends or starting fresh in 2015 so obviously I said you know what let me deliver the news to the family let's just wait for New Year's, right? And so I just went home. I called my two brothers. I have two younger twin brothers. Uh, and I told my mom, I'm on my way over there. Let's um, let's do a barbecue, a celebration. What are we celebrating? Oh, I have some great news. So when I arrived, I was the last one to arrive. I made that an entrance, right? <laughs> and I told family, we have great news. I'm like, what would happen? Dad, you have a donor. So you can imagine. Everybody was like, what? Everybody started crying. My mom started crying. My dad started crying because they were happy, happy tears. Mm -hmm. And so when everybody was like, oh my God, how what happened? And then they returned to me. How do you know about this? And we don't, right? So because it's me. <laughs> I told them because it's me. What do you mean? He got mad. And I have to tell you, I had that conviction. I had that vision of how I see my dad right now. Like I just wanted to get it over with because I knew I had seen it in my head that he was gonna be how he is right now. So I just wanted to do it, right? And then when I was about to leave that celebration, um, I told my dad, you know what? I'm still gonna do it. I believe in organ donation. I believe I, I wanna become a living donor. So my dad saw that I was very, very, you know, convinced of what I wasn't going back and he decided to show up. Wow. And what words of advice or support do you have for other people who are considering becoming a living donor? I just, um, I just have to say that go for it. You know, right now, nowadays, uh, science is so advanced um, and I encourage everybody to seek answers to all the questions because sometimes the only reason we don't take that step is because we don't know, or we don't know where to go or who to ask. But um, there's, there's people out there that are willing to guide us. And as long as you look into your heart and you wanna do it, everything will be fine. We just have to take action, follow the steps and, and everything will be fine. And, and you'll never regret it. it it's it's a, a something that I am very proud of doing something of the best things I've done in my life, if not the greatest. Lizette, thanks for sharing your family story. And thank you to the DHR Transplant Institute for explaining the living donation process. If you want to sign up to save lives or to learn more about organ donation, visit tosa1.org. We'll see you in April for the next episode of Tosa Talks.